Father in heaven, thank you for meeting with us this morning, for the power of your presence is felt. For without you, Father, there is not one reason to even be here, but you are here. And Lord, we want to say thank you. You are holy. And you are to be obeyed and loved. And you are worthy of our love. And I pray that we would love you in this moment. By receiving your word as the word of God. And not as a word of man. I pray that we would continue to worship you. In spirit and truth, as we hear your word read and proclaimed. I pray for humble, receptive hearts. I pray for lives to be changed. I pray for your power to move in me and in this auditorium. Oh, Jesus is so beautiful. And we're thankful for Jesus and what he has done for us. And we are thankful for the person of the Holy Spirit who indwells every true believer and convicts us of sin and righteousness and judgment, but also bestows upon us the tender mercies of the Lord. Lord, I say that I need you, and I pray that you would use me in this moment for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'd like to invite you to go ahead and open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, and... The title of this morning's message is Confronting the Real Problem. And that's what the passage is going to do. That's what Paul is doing through this passage. He is confronting the real problem. The problem is unbelief. Why have the Jews failed to trust in Christ as their Lord and Savior? And so Paul is going to confront this problem head on, the problem of unbelief. Let's look at our Bibles, Romans 10, and let's read verses 14 through 21. Paul writes, How will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask... Have they not heard? Indeed, they have. For the voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did not Israel understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation with a foolish nation. I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. I think we're all familiar with excuses, aren't we? Perhaps... You were even challenged with some excuses this morning, but yet you, owe, you prevailed and, and uh, you made it to church, so praise the Lord. But we hear excuses everywhere. 
especially when it comes to church attendance, public worship, being a member of a church. We hear things like, I'm way too busy. We have family time on Sundays. My kids play sports. The church just wants our money. The church, it's full of hypocrites. Or, I'm just too tired. There's an unknown, or there's a poem written by an unknown author, and this is what it says. Excuses are moments of nothingness. Just think about that for a moment. Excuses are moments of nothingness. They build bridges to nowhere. Those of us who use these tools of incompetence seldom become anything but nothing at all. I don't know if anything's ever good has come from excuses. We come to this passage of Scripture today, and we are confronted with the issue of rejection. The Jews have rejected the gospel. They have rejected God's way of salvation. The question is, why is it? Why have they refused to trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? As a matter of fact, Paul tells us in the first part of Romans 10, in Romans 10, he says that Jesus was actually a stumbling block to the Jews. When they looked at Jesus, instead of trusting in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, the Bible says they stumbled over Jesus. The question is, is why did they stumble over Jesus? Well, of course, Jesus did not meet their expectations. We'll hear more about this tonight in my message, but the reality is, is they saw no value in Jesus. They saw Jesus as nothing more than a carpenter son, a poor man with no place to lay his head. They did not see him as the Messiah. They saw him as a false prophet, a liar. They stumbled over Jesus. They've rejected the gospel. What's the reason? Is it because the gospel is not intellectually compelling? Is that the excuse? Well, the gospel is just not intellectual enough for me. Or there might be some who would say that I'm rejecting the gospel because it doesn't measure up to my intellectual demands. Or others might say, I'm not going to trust in Christ as my Lord and Savior because there's not enough proof concerning the gospel. Thus they reject it altogether. Is it because the church has failed to present the gospel? Is that the excuse? Well, it's the church's fault that I don't believe. It's the gospel's fault that I don't believe. Or, the church hasn't presented the gospel to me in a compelling way. And because of their lack of creativity in presenting the gospel, I'm just not going to receive the gospel. I'm going to reject it. Others would say, the presentation is not attractive enough. And because of that, I reject the gospel. Is it because of cultural barriers? Is that why people reject the gospel? Or perhaps communication problems? Is that why people reject the gospel? Again, we're going to deal with questions like these in this passage of Scripture, but the reality is is that these are actual excuses that people do give for rejecting Christ. It's not intellectual enough. There's not enough proof. The church isn't compelling enough. The church isn't attractive enough. And the list goes... On and on and on and on for the excuses that people make for rejecting the gospel. Now, Paul is dealing with questions just like that in our passage today. There are some people who think that this passage 
is primarily a missionary passage. You'll often hear pa pastors preach this passage, and they'll talk about the need to go out and share the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of those, right, who carry the good news. And I would say to you that there is a missionary emphasis in this text, but the primary message of the text is not one of missionary endeavor. It is one of rebuke. I want to share with you this morning three undeniable facts from this passage. Number one, People continue to reject the gospel. To this day, people continue to reject the gospel. Why? Well, you'll hear all kinds of excuses. But what we see here in this passage is that people continue to reject the gospel. And Paul is going to ask a series of questions in order to diagnose the problem. Notice these questions that Paul asks. If you look there at verse 14, he says, Well, how then will they call on him who they've not believed? First question, how will Israel call on Christ if they've not believed in him? Now, remember why he's asking these questions. These are diagnostic questions. He's wanting us to diagnose the real problem. Is the problem the gospel doesn't have enough proof? Is the problem that it's not attractive enough? Is the problem that the church has failed to preach it? Is that the problem? So he asked, how will Israel, how will the Jews call on Christ if they've not believed in him? Second question, and how are they to believe in him who they've never heard? How will Israel believe in Christ if they've never heard the gospel of Christ? He's asking these questions. Third question, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? How will Israel hear the gospel without a preacher of the gospel? And then the fourth and final question, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? So how are they to preach Christ unless they are sent? We learn something very specific about salvation here. In order for someone to be saved, the preacher must go. He must preach the gospel. The people must hear the gospel. They must believe the gospel. And they must call on Christ to save them. Uh, if you view it from the other direction, that's exactly what you see. If you read it from the bottom up, we must... God has sent the preacher. The preacher must preach the gospel. The hearer must hear the gospel, must believe in the gospel, and call on Christ to save them. So Paul asked these four questions. How will they call if they've not heard or if they've not believed? And how will they believe if they've not heard? And how will they hear unless the gospel is proclaimed? And how will the gospel pro be proclaimed unless the preacher is sent? What's the point of these questions? Why does Paul throw these questions at us the way that he does? Well, it's very simple. Paul wants us to understand the true problem of rejection. He wants to confront the real issue. Here in a moment, Paul is going to answer these questions. But he's not, we're not going to get there yet. So, is the problem this? Is the problem that God did not send preachers? Is that the problem? And if you read it from the bottom up, the preacher has to be sent. So is the problem that God did not send the preachers? Is that the problem? Or, or is the problem that God did send the preachers, but the preachers didn't preach? Is that the problem? What's the problem here? Why has Israel rejected the gospel? What is the real problem? Is it because they didn't understand? Is it because they didn't hear? What's the problem? I was talking to someone the other day, and I was attempting to share the gospel with this person, and their first response was, listen, I don't believe in all that religious stuff. That's what they told me. And I said, well, I, I don't. 
Uh, that's good because I'm not here to talk to you about religious stuff. I'm, talk, I'm here to talk to you about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And immediately there was rejection. Rejection. Was I not compelling enough? Was I not creative enough in my presentation? Was I not cool enough, hip enough? Did I not have the right color hairdo or right kind of pants on or what was it? What, what, why, why did that person reject the gospel? Well, I told you the, my first fact is, is that many people continue to reject the gospel today. Here's my second fact. Many churches have misdiagnosed the problem. I haven't told you the problem yet. See, I'm keeping you. We know there is a problem. I've given you hypotheses of what the, the problem might be. But I haven't told you what the problem is. But I will tell you that many churches have, and preachers, have misdiagnosed the problem. There are many who, in an attempt to become more attractive to the culture, they have changed the message of the gospel. And as a result, they've changed the gospel in the process. Why? Because they've misdiagnosed the problem. The problem is never with the gospel. The gospel doesn't need to be updated. The gospel doesn't need to be made hip. The gospel doesn't need a new pair of shoes. The gospel doesn't need to be more relevant. Because the gospel is already painfully relevant. The gospel confronts us with our sin. And our rebellion against God. The gospel confronts us with our eternal separation from God. And the possibility of hell without Christ. The gospel tells us of the wrath of God, but yet salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. But you see, many churches have misdiagnosed the problem. And as a result of their misdiagnosis, they have changed the message of the gospel. We see this all the time when there's no preaching on sin. It might be too offensive. No calling out of acts of unrighteousness. No faithful exposition of the word of God. No line by line preaching. I've heard people say why they've rejected the gospel or why they've rejected the church. And by the way, you can't embrace the gospel and reject the church. (laughs) Okay? It's the bride of Christ. I've heard people say, well, the message was just too abrasive, too confrontational. So, preachers are afraid to come across abrasive, they're afraid to come across offensive, even though the gospel itself is offensive because it says you've sinned against God and you deserve death. So we've watered it down. We have failed to preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth. People say, well, the message was just too abrasive. Or the church is full of hypocrites. Or the church doesn't have, my kids just don't have fun. So now you've got churches that look more like Six Flags and Disney World and AMC movie theater than they do sanctuaries for worshiping the one true God because they've misdiagnosed the problem you can walk into churches here in Edmond and when you walk into the church they'll be playing secular music when you walk in because they've misdiagnosed the problem You'll walk into some churches and it's six flags over Jesus, right? (laughs) 
Dis they give you a Disney World Jesus or an AMC movie theater Jesus. You have celebrity preachers rather than servants. The message has more in common with cotton candy than it does T-bone steak. It's sweet to your taste, but just after a few moments, it dissolves and there's nothing left. But my kids just don't have fun. The church is not cool enough. The preacher's not hip enough. These are all excuses that people make for rejecting, for rejecting Christ and His church. And many preachers and churches have misdiagnosed the problem. We live in a day where the charisma of a pastor is elevated above the Scripture. I don't know what he preached today, but boy, he preached it. I don't know what he preached today, but did you see those sneakers he had on? I don't know what he preached today, but he must work out because his guns were just pumped. Listen, it's about Jesus. It's not about personality, charisma. It's not about me making church more palatable for you to swallow or making the message more sweet to your taste. It's to be faithful to preach the Word of God. That's what, I'm, that's what we're called to do is to open this Bible and preach the Word of God line by line. I am to do nothing personally in my preaching. Listen, I am to do nothing personally in my preaching to distract from the Word. Does that make sense? From the way I behave up here on stage, from the way I behave, from the things I say, by the way I carry myself, I am to do nothing to draw attention to me in order to distract from the Word. I am to do nothing to play upon your emotion. I am to do nothing to make you feel more, to, to add things of the world in here so that you'll feel more comfortable when you first walk in. When you come to church, you ought to hear the Word of God and you ought to be confronted with the Gospel. And many churches and pastors have misdiagnosed the problem. They think the problem is we're not cool enough, let's be cooler. We're not hip enough, let's be hipper. We're not attractive enough, so let's be more attractive. We're not entertaining enough, so let's be more entertaining. We're not worldly enough, so let's be more worldly. We're not fun enough, so let's be funner. You get the idea? And what people are failing to realize, and in all seriousness, what people are failing to realize is that the gospel message is actually being changed in the midst of all this. being changed if you are not getting line by line preaching of the word of God then how do you know that that preacher is even being faithful to the text how do you know he didn't just wake up this week and say you know what I've got this great sermon idea and I'm going to pick this passage this passage and this passage and this passage and this passage in order to preach my sermon idea but when you are preaching line by line through the Word of God, you know what you have to do? You've got to deal with the next passage. No matter what it's about, you've got to deal with it. And so people reject the gospel today, and many churches have misdiagnosed the problem. Third fact, the diagnosis is hard to accept. The diagnosis is hard to accept. 
we come back to the Word of God, and he says in verse 14, how will they call on whom they have not believed, and how will they believe on whom they've never heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? And then this beautiful passage from, from Isaiah 52, verse 7, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And the context of that is this, is that the nation of Israel, has, they've been taken away into Babylonian captivity. But the picture is someone running over the top of the hill, running as fast as they can. I can remember working in the hayfield when I was a kid. And you're bent over and you're, you're grabbing square bales of hay and you're stacked, throwing them on the trailer. And, and all of a sudden, sister comes running over the top of the hill, running as fast as she can, screaming, Mama's got lunch ready. <laughs> Best news I'd heard all day. <sighs> Means I get to go inside in the air conditioner with some sweet tea and eat whatever it is that Mama had made that day. That's the picture here. Here's the nation of Israel. They are in Babylonian captivity. And the messenger comes running over the top of the hill and says, we're going back. We're going back. We're going back to the promised land. The Lord says, how beautiful are the feet of those who do that. Who run over the top of the hill and preach Jesus. How beautiful are the feet of those who run over the top of the wheel, the hill and say to a world that is lost and held in captivity to sin and say, Jesus will set you free. Now Paul's going to answer those questions. How beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news, who preach the good news. But here's the problem. Look here. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what has heard from us? Notice he's going to answer the questions that he had asked pre previously. The first answer is this. Israel has not failed to call on the Lord. Is, or I'm sorry, Israel has failed to call on the Lord not because God didn't send preachers. That's not the problem. God did send preachers. That's why he's quoting from Isaiah 52 verse 7. God is saying, I sent my preachers. I sent them. Who's he quoting from? He's quoting from the, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was one of those preachers. Who came preaching to the nation of Israel. So the issue is not with the fact that preachers haven't been sent. That's not why they haven't called on the Lord. Well, is it because the preachers didn't preach? God sent them, but maybe they didn't preach. He says, For the Lord who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Have they not heard? The preachers were sent and the preachers did preach. They did hear. Their rejection is not because the preachers didn't, weren't sent. The pre, the, their rejection is not because the preachers didn't preach. Their rejection is not because the gospel is not intellectual enough. The, 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 that's not the reason why they rejected. The, the, the answer is not because the gospel wasn't relative enough or wasn't communicated correctly. That's not the problem. The, the problem is not that the gospel wasn't attractive enough or hip enough or cool enough or sensitive enough or none of those things. That's not the problem. The preachers were sent and the preachers did preach. He says, quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 1, verse 18, But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have, for the voice has gone out to all the earth. They were sent and they preached, and their words to the ends of the world. So it's not because preachers weren't sent. And it's not because preachers didn't preach. I'm talking about those preachers who have faithfully preached the gospel. There's many out there who aren't. But we're, the context is God's Old Testament prophets. He says they were sent and they preached. Thirdly, 
It's not because Israel didn't hear. Because they did hear. We saw that earlier. He says, faith come by hearing, hearing by the word. And the message was proclaimed throughout the whole earth. It's not because they didn't hear. Was it because they didn't understand? No, they understood. Look at verse 19. But I ask, did not Israel understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous for those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. God prophesied in the Old Testament that the Jews would reject him and that he would save the Gentiles in order to make the Jews jealous. They knew about it. It was prophesied long ago. They knew about it. They understood it. Verse 20, then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not see me. He's talking about the Gentiles. And I have shown myself to those who did not ask me. They know. When they, when they see the Gentiles coming to faith in Christ, then they should know that the purpose of that is to make them jealous so that they will come to faith in Christ. They understood this. So what's the problem? It's not that preachers haven't been sent. In this context. And it's not that preachers didn't proclaim. And it's not that they didn't hear. And it's. So, so what's the problem? What's the problem? Well we know this. It's not an intellectual problem. Well, we just need to be, we just need smarter, more intellectual preachers. Not an intellectual problem. It's not an atmosphere of our problem. Well, the atmosphere of the church just isn't right for me. I need more lights and smoke and cameras and action and more, I need more of that kind of stuff. It's not the atmosphere. It's not even a cultural problem. Nor is it a stylistic problem. Well, the reason that people aren't receiving the gospel at that church is because it's true traditional. It's not contemporary enough. That's not the problem. You see, the problem is located somewhere else. So the question is, is, where is the problem? It's about right here. That's the problem. The heart of the problem is the heart of the problem. He says, look at it, go back to your Bibles and I'll show you. He says in verse 21, but of Israel, he says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. The problem of unbelief and rejection of the gospel is the heart of the person who refuses to believe. There is a correlation here between disobedience and unbelief. The reason that someone refuses to receive the gospel is none of those things that we described before. That's pragmatism. That's man's attempt to try to decorate the gospel to make it more acceptable. And as a result, the gospel message gets changed. The reason that people reject the gospel is because of their own moral depravity. Because of their own hard-heartedness and obstinance to Christ. Has led them to refuse to trust in Christ. Some of you may be sitting here today. and You're sitting in unbelief. And you've made all types of excuses for why you don't follow Christ or why you're not involved in the church. And you've made all these excuses. Can I just say to you that your excuses are nothing more than monuments of nothingness? Your excuses 
mean nothing. And the only thing they deserved, served to do is to reveal the, the, the obstinance and the, the, the rebellion of your own heart. As we read earlier in the poem, your excuses only build bridges to nowhere. Excuses are nothing more than tools of incompetence. And those who live their lives by making excuses, blaming others, blaming the church, blaming the preacher, seldom become anything but nothing at all. If you have not received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it's because of your own heart. It's because of your own unbelief. It has nothing to do whether or not church is boring or exciting. It has to do with your heart. And I would plead with you. I come running over the hill this morning. And God has sent you a preacher. And the preacher has proclaimed the good news. That Jesus sets the captives free. And he will save you from all your sin. If you trust in him as your personal Lord and Savior, He will deliver you this day from the domain of darkness and He will transfer you into the kingdom of His beloved Son. I say to you that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I come running over the hill. Will you say yes? Will you trust this day in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. For the church, I say this. I told you that there is a missionary emphasis in this passage. However, it's a rebuke primarily for unbelief. But let me give you a missionary application. Here it is. The gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for all. It doesn't matter where people live, who they are, their ethnicity, their color of skin, their economic status. It doesn't matter. The gospel is for anyone. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Secondly, because the gospel is for all, it must be preached to all. The gospel must be preached to all. We must go into every highway and byway. We must go under the bridge. And we must go into the gated communities. We must go everywhere. We must go into Edmund. We must go into Indonesia. We must go into India. We must go from the end of our nose to the ends of the earth preaching that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the gospel is for all. The gospel must be preached to all. And the Bible says that those who are faithful have beautiful feet in the eyes of the Lord. Thirdly though, we know that the gospel will not be accepted by all. But the victory is in the obedience. The victory is in the faithfulness. The gospel will not be accepted by all. Not everyone who you seek to share your faith with will come to faith in Christ. But that's not the point. Our point is not to save anybody. Our point is to be faithful to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with integrity, with the hopes of seeing those who are lost come to faith in Christ. Therefore, our job as a church, as a family of faith, listen to me, our job as a family of faith, Edmonds First Baptist, is to leverage everything that we have, every resource that is provided to us. We are to leverage it for the sake of the gospel. We are to take our budget, we are to take our prayers, we are to take our connection groups, we are to take this pulpit, we are to take everything that we are and everything that we do and we are to use it for the sake of the gospel with the hopes of seeing those who are lost come to faith 
in Jesus. We must be faithful stewards of all that God has entrusted to us. And if we are aligned with people or organizations that are not being faithful, then we have a responsibility to call them to faithfulness. And if they aren't faithful, then we have a responsibility to take what we have and use it in a way that honors the Lord. Period. I'll tell you right now, listen to me. I am not interested. Please hear what I'm about to say. I am not interested in one single bit. One little bit. I am not interested even to the smallest degree. I am not interested at all in the political ideas of the Southern Baptist Convention. I am not interested in the politics of the Southern Baptist Convention. I am interested in reaching people for Christ. I am interested in preaching the gospel because it's for all and I'm interested in leveraging all that we have for the sake of Jesus. I'm not concerned about anybody else's ministry even though I pray for a lot of ministries. I'm concerned about the ministry of Edmonds First Baptist Church where God has called me to be the pastor and to lead with vision and to use what we have to be faithful to this cause. Period. That's what God's called me to do. I'm not trying to climb a ladder. I'm not trying to get in, in anybody's good graces. I'm not trying to kiss anybody's well we'll stop at that. I'm not trying. Listen. I just want to be faithful to Jesus. That's it. And win people to Christ. Period. And so we are a family of faith. And our job is to passionately connect people to Christ. And his church. And his word. And his mission. For his glory. So let us be faithful church. In that task that God has given us. And for those of you who have been making excuses, no more. Would you come to Christ this morning and be saved? Would you join the church and become a member? Do you need to be scripturally baptized and you haven't? Then stop making excuses. Follow the Lord in baptism. Have you been making excuses for not getting plugged into a connection group? Then stop making excuses. Have you been making excuses for staying at home in your your pajamas and just watching church online? Have you been making excuses for that? No more excuses. They lead to nothingness. No more excuses. We have confronted the real issue. And the issue's here. So would you get right with the Lord today? I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your heads. Here in a moment, we're going to give a time of personal response. An opportunity for you to respond to the Lord in faith. Our pastors are up here. I will be up here. And you just come and you say, I've been making excuses. But today I am coming to trust in Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. No more excuses. Today I'm coming to receive Christ by faith. Others of you say, I know I'm saved, but I haven't aligned with this church yet. And I'm I'm ready to align and become a member of this church. Then you come. You may be a member of a connection group, but you've never joined the church. There's a difference. Then you come. Maybe you say, you know what? I I know I need to be scripturally baptized. I've been putting it off. I've been making excuses. But I just want to settle that today. I want to come and, and make a commitment to follow the Lord in baptism in the next few weeks. You come. Father, we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand now and come as the Lord leads?